good morning. I hope everybody's having a wonderful morning. Uh, this is Ranger Jody. I am filling in for Ranger Jennifer, who cannot be here today. But we are starting back up our social Saturdays, except we had to move it to Friday for the time being. Uh, so hopefully that will go okay. And I want to welcome everyone to Andersonville National Historic Site and Andersonville National Cemetery. Uh, hope everyone is doing good this morning. When we did our last Facebook Live broadcast two weeks ago, uh, we asked where you all would like us to show the next time and the majority opinion was Andersonville National Cemetery. Hey Clarence! Um, and so we are doing Andersonville National Cemetery today. Uh, good morning. And I am, like I said, filling in for Jennifer because she couldn't be here today. I'm kind of pinch hitting and I am much less tech savvy than she is. So please bear with me. Sorry, I had a late start, but I couldn't figure out how to turn the Facebook Live on. So I had to call Jennifer and have her <laughs> coach me through it. Uh, but anyway, we're getting going. Um, so it is a beautiful morning here at Andersonville National Cemetery. I'm going to take you just through a very small portion of the cemetery, talk about a few things, but there's so much to talk about here. Um, you know, with over 20,000 graves, uh, there's a lot to talk about. So I'm just going to touch on a few things. Uh, and we want to have, you know, we have plenty to talk about for a number of live programs in the future. So if I don't touch on what you're wanting, and if I miss seeing the comments in the thing, because uh, I, like I said, I don't know half of how to work this Facebook Live thing, but uh, Jennifer, Ranger Jennifer, is also tag teaming with me, and she is on her laptop live, and so she'll be able to answer some of the questions that I either miss or uh, am uncertain of or whatever. Sabrina, sorry to hear that your brother is buried here. Uh, thank you for his service. I like mornings like this, it's kind of cool, but I am taking my turn with the coffee and having some coffee this morning and uh, showing y'all some of the cemetery. But I hope y'all are having a wonderful morning. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Um, all right. We're gonna start, we're starting here in the corner, it, well, at the entrance that you would come in to, uh, from, if you were coming from the museum, the visitor center, um, this is where you would come in to the cemetery. And let me walk out a little bit so you can see it. That's the Georgia Monument there. That's the first thing you see when you come into the cemetery very unique monument. It's actually the only one that was put here for uh, all Georgia POWs, not just Civil War POWs. Hey, from Panama City. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your granddaddy, Miss Stewart. Um, so this was put here in 1976, if I recall correctly. Uh, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, was uh, instrumental in getting this put here. Uh, former president, of course, he was not president at that time, but that was a unique monument here, so I wanted to show that. And it shows where you are to begin with when you come into the cemetery. So, I'm gonna see if I can get this thing turned around uh, to where y'all can look at some more stuff. All right, okay, so here are some of the trench burials. And I'm going to talk about those and what the trench burials mean. 
uh, Stephen, who was the first burial? I'm actually going to talk about that. Yay! I picked one topic that y'all like. <laughs> so, with that, I'm going to start walking around. If I can get my stuff together here. And see if I can show you some stuff. Alright. For those that were on the broadcast a couple of weeks ago, you'll know that Andersonville National Historic Site... It was established in 1970. Um, it has three components, basically. Andersonville National Cemetery, which we're looking at today. The site of the historic Camp Sumter prison, which was a Civil War prison uh, that was here in 1864-65, and the National Prisoner of War Museum. We actually have dual purposes of sharing the stories and preserving the site of the Civil War military prison, but also sharing the stories of all American POWs from the Revolutionary War to today. It's a great honor to be able to do that. All right, so prisoner burials. I'm going to come back to this wayside and talk about that a little bit. But first, we are going to take a look at the very first person buried here on these hallowed grounds. Let's see if I can do this without messing it up. <laughs> these, you can see these are trench burials. You'll notice that the headstones are very, very close together. They're easy to tell from the quote-unquote modern burials, which is basically all the ones after the trench burials. So, when you start from the Georgia Monument and you go down along the wall here, back here at these trees, this is where the very first prisoner was buried. And this gimbal thing is weird. I'm gonna see if I can do this. All right. So, Adam Swarner, he was the very first prisoner to be buried here at Andersonville. National Cemetery, what would later become the cemetery. And his story is very interesting. He uh, was actually originally labeled as Jacob Swarner on the headstone. Um, the prison site opened February 24th, 1864, was when the first prisoners arrived on site. The prison wasn't even completely finished at that point. And you'll notice that his date of death, you can see that, is February 27th. So only three days after the prison got his first prisoners. So uh, he died of pneumonia, that's right. Who said that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yes, Adam Swarner, he died of pneumonia just three days after the first prisoners arrived. Uh, he was actually buried in a single grave, uh, unlike the later prisoners where it was a trench. When they first started having deaths, you know, they didn't realize how many they were going to have. And so they just buried him in the first uh, several, uh, I think the first hundred or two of the deaths in individual graves. But very, very quickly, they got overwhelmed and began burying in the trench burial fashion. So, Adam Swarner is back here at the corner. And you'll notice that modern burials are back there behind this section. So the front near the road trench burials and you're welcome Mallory and here at the back of this section are the modern burials 
that happened later. So, I mentioned that Adam Swarner was misidentified, and actually his headstone was originally marked as Jacob Swarner. Well, Jacob was his brother, and uh, his headstone, this headstone, had the name jo Jacob Swarner on it for a long time, all the way until, say, the 1950s, late 1950s. So, in 1961, uh, Adams, great grandson, uh, contacted the U.S. Army Department of the Army, who was managing the prison site at that time, and he told them that they had the wrong name on this headstone, that it was actually Adam and not Jacob. Jacob was his brother, and he brought documentation to show that, and so at that time, the Army uh, was replacing headstones that had errors on them. And so they actually replaced that headstone in 1961 to reflect that it was Adam Swarner. His brother Jacob died just a few months later, five months later, and uh, he is actually buried also here in the cemetery in grave number 4005. So who knows? Maybe he, I mean, he was obviously lived and was here passed when his brother died that he died just a few months later thank you Lori I appreciate that you're all thanks because uh, this was a little challenging to pull off but we're doing it <laughs> all right so let me go back up here oh one thing I forgot to talk about I did want to talk about while I was here at Adam's grave you'll notice that on some of these headstones such as this one, I'm sorry, I don't know how to angle this thing very well. Uh, and Adam Swarner's grave, see on the top there that there's coins. So people have asked, you'll see a number of the headstones that have coins on top of them. And uh, people have asked me, asked us what, what the coins mean. Cause you'll see pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, in various headstones on various headstones throughout the cemetery uh, Roy Webb uh, I'll talk about how many are unknown of the trench burials actually because I'm going to talk about how they got identified here in just a minute so the coins it's a military tradition and they put the value of the coin it's a way to pay respects to the person buried there and the value of the coin is supposed to signify how, uh, their relationship to the deceased. So if it's a penny, they are just paying their respects, giving honor to that veteran that's buried there. If it's a nickel, they trained with that veteran. If it's a dime, they served with that veteran. And if it's a quarter, they were there when the veteran died when that soldier died that's what it's supposed to be now we find quarters on civil war headstones and obviously the person that left the quarter was not there 150 years ago when the uh, individual in that grave died but nonetheless it's a way of honoring the ones buried here and we certainly appreciate that Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the burials. This is one of our waysides here. It has a photo. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. It has a photo that was taken by, there we go, A.J. Riddle. It's an actual photo of the prison, of the cemetery, while it was in operation. And you can see in that photo, they have a long trench dug and they're just laying the dead prisoners shoulder to shoulder with no coffins or anything in that trench. And so that's how the trench burials, once, the, once they started getting numbers of burials, a lot of dead and kind of getting overwhelmed. Um, yes, Cheryl, you can put these on your website. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, so once they started getting 
a bunch of deaths, they went to these trench burials. And you'll notice the people that are doing the burying are actually prisoners. They're mostly uh, um, on a work detail prisoners that were basically sent to do things like collect firewood, bury the dead. They had a lot of prisoners doing that sort of thing. So, and also this wayside talks a little bit about Dorrance Atwater. That's this gentleman right here. So Dorrance Atwater was one of those prisoners that got assigned to work detail. And he, uh, helped keep the death register and yes Stephen uh, the remains are still there they're still in those spots with no coffin whatever remains are left are there so thank you for that question it is sad yes uh, so Dorrance Atwater was assigned to help maintain like like as a clerk to help maintain the death register. Whenever the prisoners died, they would hopefully have somebody that would mark their name, somebody that knew them that could tell them the name and where they were from or what regiment they were with. And they would, uh, there were so many dying. At one point in August of 1864, there was over a hundred dying every day. Uh, and it, so they would load the dead in, wagon, in a wagon take them to what they called the dead house and process them because they couldn't just take them all to bury them and they wanted to keep records. Uh, so Dorrance Atwater was assigned to help keep that list of the dead. He would just give them the next number of death, uh, death number 5,206 or whatever it might be. Uh, it was Joe Smith or whatever his name was. He was with the such and such regiment, 15th Pennsylvania or whatever it might be. And as far as we can tell, his cause of death was dysentery or scurvy or chronic diarrhea uh, or whatever it might be. And so Dorrance Atwater, he was a prisoner here for I think about 10 months and he uh, secretly made a copy. Remember everything was by hand at that point. So he secretly made a copy of that list and because uh, he was afraid that they have they might try to cover it up so he made a copy of that list he smuggled it out he was actually he survived he was paroled and he smuggled that list out of the prison and at the end of the war keep in mind he was only like 18 19 when he became a prisoner so it's a pretty amazing story um, he at the end of the war he took that list and he and Clara Barton and a, a contingent of Union soldiers led by uh, Captain James Moore, if I recall, traveled down to Andersonville Prison to the cemetery site here. Let me see if I can get this back up here. And uh, to establish the National Cemetery and give these uh, graves headstones. So when they were actually buried, at the time they were buried, they were just given a stake with a number on it, number 2,602 or whatever. And that was the only thing marking that spot, that grave. They did not have names. But the, name, the number 2,602 matched up, or in this case 1,047 here, matched up to a name in that list that Dorrance Atwater kept. So all these graves just had numbered stakes at the end of the war. Uh, Dorrance Atwater, Clara Barton, and the soldiers came down and they took Dorrance Atwater's list and matched up the numbers to the names and uh, gave the prisoners a headstone with their name on it. It was a wooden headstone at that point. And then that was in fall of 1865, July, August time frame of 1865 when the cemetery was established. And they got wooden headboards with the numbers and the names on them and then a few years later in the 1870s uh, they got marble headstones so that is how all of these took place and i'll show you there's several sections of the uh, trench burials but we're going to focus on this section today there's plenty plenty to talk about 
So let's start, start taking a stroll down through here. Uh, you can see on this other side, there's another section of these trench burials, just thousands and thousands of men that died for their country. I will figure out how to work this thing eventually by the end of the tour. <laughs> there we go. All right, so there are thousands of these graves And it's a beautiful, beautiful day here at Andersonville. These are two of the sections. There's still another section further down that we're not gonna get to today. All right, so we're gonna walk on down here. I tell you, Jennifer talked about last, let me turn this around for a second, if I can. There we go. Jennifer talked about two weeks ago how she is needs her coffee to get going in the morning. Well, she's a morning person and I am not a morning person. So I need even more caffeine. Again, you can see those rows of headstones behind me. But thank you, Herman. I appreciate it. I'm trying. So we will head down this way Section D, yes, that is our current area that we're burying in. So we will head down this way. Let me turn this back around. Just wanted to say hi. All right. So are we coming, we are coming up on one of the monuments here in the cemetery. This is the Iowa monument. It's one of my favorites. Let's take a little walk over there. And by the way, this is section K over here at the cemetery. Hey, Don. <laughs> Good to see you or talk to you or chat with you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm having a hard time with this thing. Okay. All right. There we go. This is the Iowa Monument. I like it. I just think it's sad but beautiful. Um, there. You can see it better there. A lady weeping for the prisoners buried here. So at the end of the war, <laughs> at the end of the war, a number of states were invited and encouraged by uh, veterans groups and their auxiliaries like the Women's Relief Corps and the Ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, they were encouraged to help memorialize this site and uh, help make sure that it wasn't forgotten what happened here. And so the Iowa Monument is one of the ones that has names of the prisoners. This side has a reference to Revelation. As you can see, there we go. The Revelation on this side. Iowa honors the turf that wraps their clay the unknown at that time. Uh, no, they were already known by that time. Their names recorded in the archives of their country. And you can see on this side, hard to see all of them, but there's some of the names of the ones from citizens from Iowa who died here as prisoners of war. You're welcome, Chris. And this side also has names. And you'll notice at the top, it says death before dishonor. That's a name that a number of the monuments here have are inscribed with the words death before dishonor. And you see also that a 
there's a visitor. Uh, this was erected by the state of Iowa in 1905. It was not the first monument. We're gonna go on down and take a look at these. These are still the trench burials. Remember we started at one over there. We are now up to, there's 1,768. And you can see this sea of headstones. All right, and we're coming up is another monument that's the Connecticut monument <clears throat> that one has a soldier on the top and benches at the bottom it is also a very nice very pretty monument there are a total, the t actual total, sorry I'm going a little fast, is 12,920 prisoners of war that died on these grounds about a half a mile away in 14 months. Twelve thousand nine hundred twenty, out of a bit, an estimated forty-five thousand prisoners that came through the prison site, that works out to about a twenty-eight, twenty-nine percent death rate. Great to hear, Mary, that your ninety-three-year-old mother is watching in North Carolina. There are some from New Jersey. I couldn't tell you exactly where they are, but I know we have some from New Jersey. And in fact, this is the New Jersey Monument, erected for their dead. Erected by the state of New Jersey in commemoration of the fidelity and heroism of her soldiers who died at the Confederate military prison, Andersonville, Georgia, in faithful adherence to their pledge of patriotism. And this other side, there we go. Go stranger to New Jersey, tell her that we here in fulfillment of her mandate and our pledge to maintain the proud name of our state unsullied and place it high on the scroll of honor among the states of this great nation. Hi, from Lewisburg in Oklahoma. Awesome. That's great. The sun's at a weird angle. Let me see if I can get this side of that monument so you can see the top up there. If I can, there we go. There's the top. soldier watching over those in this hallowed ground. And this one also mentions on this side the number of dead from uh, New Jersey that they knew of at that time, 235. All right, so again, we're going to continue down this way and we're going to go to the grave of one of my favorite stories, if I can find one, if I can find it. One of the things we get asked about, and that was kind of a mystery to me too for some time, you'll notice that this grave is different. 3409 J.H. Thomas. You'll notice that it's 
thinner than the other headstones and it does not have the inscribed shield like the other ones after researching some of this our cemetery administrator found that those are actually civilian headstones so they weren't soldiers there's not too many of those but they were a few there were a few civilians that died and were buried in the trenches here so that's what that is let me swap this thing around again look at that beautiful blue sky i love it so glad to have y'all joining us Let's continue our journey down this way. Now let me see if I can find what I'm looking for. Oh, somebody asked about the unknowns. Let me show you this too. So here, here's one of the unknowns, unknown US soldier. Okay, so why do we even have some unknowns since we had Dorrance Atwater's list? Because of his list, we were able, or they were able at the time, to identify 95% of all of these thousands of men that are buried in these trenches, which is just an amazing thing. A typical Civil War cemetery, only about half of them are identified and half are listed. So, we have 95% identified. And there are still a few unknown because for one thing, Lawrence Atwater wasn't here the entire time. He didn't have everyone's name who died here, but he had a pretty complete list. And I'm sure there were probably a few unknown, you know, at the time they died that people didn't know who they were. But Jennifer has more expertise than I do on that stuff, so she may be able to fill that in. Let me see if I can find the one that I'm looking for. Uh, hold on. A step over this. There we go. Okay, I think I passed it. I am looking for grave 3585. favorite stories of this place. There we go. All right. Ha -ha. I'm getting the hang of this thing. Okay. This is grave 3,585. James H. Gooding. He was a corporal from Massachusetts. And his story is one of my favorite stories. Um, he was a member of the USCT, which is the United States Colored Troops, right? So he, he was a man, in my opinion, who was very ahead of his time. He was born into slavery in 1838, as I recall, in North Carolina. At a very young age, his father, well, a man named James Gooding, who may have been his father, purchased his freedom and he was sent to New York. He was educated, which was unusual for anyone at that time, much less African Americans at that time were not really allowed to be educated, but he was educated. He attended a school called the uh, New York Colored Orphans Asylum. It was run by some Quaker women, mostly. And so he was well-educated. He grew up there uh, in that area in New York. And at about age 18, at some point, he decided to hide the fact that he had been born a slave and he told people he was born free. But at the age of 18, he went to New Bedford, Massachusetts and he joined a whaling crew, which was pretty interesting. 
there's actually a New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park up there that also talks about him. So, so he joined this whaling crew and he uh, uh, went on these whaling voyages. He actually wrote poetry and wrote things while he was out at sea. Uh, and whaling industry at that time was one of the very few, whoops, very few industries. I don't know what I just did. I'm gonna try not handle this thing too much. Uh, whaling industry was one of the few industries at that time in the 1800s that African Americans could actually get on an equal footing with whites. And uh, he earned, while he was a whaler, working on that whaling ship, he earned, uh, he got to where he earned up to $30 a month, which doesn't seem like much today, of course, but that was quite a bit at that time. It was equivalent to the salary of one of the officers on the ship. And so he was doing pretty well. Um, then he decided to leave the whaling ship, leave the whaling life, daggone it, I don't know what I'm doing. And he settled in New Bedford and got married to a lady named Ellen Allen. Um, and six days before he got married, President Lincoln announced that he was gonna uh, uh, sign and proclaim this Emancipation Proclamation. So this was in September. Uh, of 1863 and he uh, announced that this Emancipation Proclamation would take effect in January 1st and so after that took effect it opened the door for African Americans to uh, enlist in the military and 14 days later James Gooding enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts which is pretty amazing he left his new new bride and enlisted for his country. And he traveled with the 54th Massachusetts, which if you ever saw the movie Glory with Denzel Washington and those other actors, a bunch of other actors, that's about the 54th Massachusetts. So he traveled with them and went to the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. He would write letters back to his hometown newspaper. Um, movie glory uh, culminates in he survived that uh, he noted that even the white soldiers cheered them for their bravery in that assault which was pretty pretty amazing um, and at that time black soldiers were paid only ten dollars a month by the military whereas white soldiers were paid thirteen dollars a month and uh, he felt that was an injustice, as rightly so. And he actually wrote a letter. This was a former slave during the Civil War, fighting for the country. And he actually wrote President Lincoln an open letter demanding equal pay for these black soldiers. It's pretty amazing. So he sent that letter and then uh, he fought, he was one of the soldiers that fought at the Battle of Alesti in Florida. He was wounded and captured there. His wife, well, the other soldiers thought he had been killed in that battle. So they reported he had been killed. His wife was told he had been killed, but he'd actually been wounded and captured. He was eventually brought here to Andersonville uh, to Camp Sumter Military Prison, and he died here on July 19th if i remember right of 1864 and you know it's even more tragic that he did not he died without ever knowing that just a few weeks before in june congress had actually passed legislation giving african-american soldiers equal pay it's pretty amazing like i said a man ahead of his time and one of my very favorite stories james gooding
All right. We actually talk about him on our website, on one of our pages. Okay. Sorry for that digression. I went maybe into too much detail. A lusty in Florida. That's right, Angela. then let's walk over here this way it's kind of windy I'll show you the flag is blowing pretty nicely it's got our American flag and our POW flag on it Geraldine James if you know somebody that's a Civil War African American USCT reenactor we would love to have them come and potentially do a program here. Look at that sun shining. Please contact us if you think you might be willing to do that. We would love to. get a better view of that whole section of Civil War burials, trench burials. I am actually going to the Raiders. That is my next stop. <laughs> Thank you for asking about that. So the Raiders are one of the most interesting and asked about stories here so who were the raiders when you get over here to this section and you notice all these trench burials all these tightly clustered tightly road headstones and then you come over here and there are these six that are by themselves separated. So what's the deal with that? Uh, let me see. There we go. So we get asked about this a lot. These are the Raiders graves. They, during the summer of 1864, around May time frame, so you got a picture back in 1864, you've got thousands of men crowded into this 26... I think at that time it was still 16 and a half acre uh, enclosure. Uh, you're going to have a criminal element in any large group of people. And these were some of that criminal element, some of the worst. They uh, started assaulting and beating some of the other prisoners, taking what they had. Uh, they organized into groups, basically gangs, of raiders that eventually got called raiders. And it was actually pretty short-lived. Uh, people, it's such a known story that people think that it defined the whole Andersonville story. But actually, it was only a few weeks, period, that we're talking about. They really started becoming more prominent, uh, committing more crimes, being more organized, more bold. In May uh, and early June, shoot, man. coffee cut down. In May and early June of 1864, the prison had around 21,000 men at that point. Um, and they started openly assaulting and some said even killing prisoners in broad daylight. Uh, and so the other prisoners basically approached the Confederate authorities and said we need to do something about these guys uh, there was a number of them maybe 75 to 100 or more of them organized in these gangs mostly uh, these raider groups and they asked if they could form their own the prisoners asked if they could form kind of their own police force to an extent called the regulators and they said they wanted to find and uh, arrest these guys and get get them uh, out of the prison and uh, bring justice to them. 
So they got support from the Confederate uh, troops to do that and the authorities, Confederate authorities. They went around in late June, uh, early July, as I recall, and rounded up. A lot of them were known because, yeah, that's right, it was the hottest time of the year, that's right. Uh, a lot of them were known. They knew it was so-and-so that would go around and attack people. So they rounded them up. Um, Captain Wirtz, which was one of the commanders of the prison, separated the prisoners that they had captured, arrested, some, somewhere between 75 and 100 or more, separated them off out of the prison uh, so that they could hold a trial, basically. And so uh, the, the prisoners themselves held the equivalent of a military court-martial for these raiders. And they, they had a jury, they had judges, the whole nine yards. And they tried these individuals, these 75 to 100 plus individuals, uh, found them guilty of, the ones found guilty, which was a number of them, of various crimes that were less severe, like theft or simple assault or something like that. Some of those prisoners had to run what they called the gauntlet. That's where the gauntlet. And what they did was release the prisoners back into the, the convicted back into the prison they had to run along a double line of the prisoners holding sticks and clubs and they actually beat the prisoners the convicted ones as they came through that line and one of the one of the convicted prisoners actually died of the wounds that he got through the by running the gauntlet but the six ringleaders which are these six individuals the six most notorious that basically the murdering of people uh, they were convicted and sentenced to death by hanging and so the uh, the commanders of the prison allowed the prisoners to get wood and actually construct a gallows and these six men were brought to the gallows and hung on July 11th of 1864 one of the men one of these six men and I don't think, as far as I know, we don't know who, but one of these six men, uh, the rope broke, and he dropped down and ran, tried to flee into the crowd. The crowd quickly recaptured him and took him back up there and committed, you know, continued the sentence and hung him. And so these six men, once they were hung, the prisoners themselves, requested that these six men not be buried together with the honorable men, uh, the rest of the prisoners over here. And so these six men were buried separately. And they do not receive any military honors. Basically, they're convicted murderers, and they receive no military honors. Even today, when we do Memorial Day or Reese Across America, anything where we place a flag or a wreath or any kind of honor on the graves of these six did not get that honor. Okay, that is the story of the Raiders. So to have one last stop I would like to do if y'all will bear with me. Uh, you're asking about interesting burials in the modern day plots and actually I'm going to end with one of those because of what today is, if I can find this grave. Let me switch this back over so y'all can look at some other stuff while I am walking and drinking my coffee. over there here let me switch this back around here at Andersonville it is an active national cemetery I know there's one uh, Korea who fought in Korea and Vietnam This one fought in World War II. We are still 
an active national cemetery, which means we are still burying veterans today. Uh, it's basically the same requirements as it would be if you wanted to be buried in any national cemetery. So if you're interested in finding out if you're eligible. Yeah, Herman, grab you a cup too. <laughs> uh, you ask if the park is open. You see visitors driving around. The cemetery is open right now, Monday through Friday, eight to five. It's closed on the weekends, but it is open Monday through Friday. Just the cemetery, the rest of the park is not open right now. And we are still doing funerals and burials. <clears throat> this is one of the newest, well, actually it is the newest monument, the last monument that was placed here in, at Andersonville. This is the Stalag 17B monument. And it is dedicated to American former prisoners of war of Stalag 17B and of all American POWs held in a German prison camp, uh, held as POWs in the European theater during World War II. This monument, which again is the last one placed here, was uh, placed in 1989. So it's very, relatively, very recent. Most of our monuments were placed here in the early 1900s. 1910 time frame. All right, so let me see if I can find what I'm looking for. These are memorial headstones up here near the rostrum. These are ones where there's no remains. Placed a memorial stone here in honor of them. That's the rostrum up there, which is where we do the funerals. And these two sections adjacent to the rostrum are memorial headstones right now. All right, here's the headstone I'm looking for. we go all right I'm gonna finish my presentation program tour chat <laughs> with this grave this is Harold S Hershey he was a private in the US Army Air Corps in World War II um, he was a prisoner of war he got a bronze star and a purple heart and it took him The time where he was a POW and killed, died in World War II, to the point where his remains were identified, recovered, and brought here and buried here in honor. That journey took 75 years. Um, Private Hershey served in World War II. He was captured after the Battle of Matan and Corregidor Island. He was captured on Corregidor in, I believe it was May of 1942. And he was taken to a prisoner of war camp where he died of disease there at the prisoner of war camp serving his country. Uh, he was buried with 13 other prisoners in a mass grave at the camp, Cap Cabinotten prison camp and uh, he 
was left unidentified in that mass grave for some time. A couple of different times, the POW MIA uh, company agency tried to uh, dug up the remains that was in that mass grave trying to identify the remains. But his remains were not identified until 2014. He survived the Bataan Death March, which started today. Uh, the fall of Bataan and Corregidor was yesterday, April 9th, 1942. And on April 10th, they started marching them up to these prison camps and many of them died on the, on the way. So in honor of that summer anniversary, I wanted to highlight Harold Hershey's story. So he was identified finally in 2014. His remains were sent back to his family and his family chose to have him buried in honor here at Andersonville National Cemetery. So thank you, Private Hershey, for your service as well. I think that that concludes our program. I do hope that you enjoyed it. And if I can get this back down. Uh, Jennifer, I know, has been on online uh, answering questions. Thank you so much. I hope I did a good job. Thank you. Um, we are trying to be safe, Harry. Thank you. And we will continue doing these Facebook Live. Like I said, there's so much to talk about. I only talked about a small portion of the National Cemetery, and we have the prison site, various areas in there, um, and uh, the Prisoner of War Museum that we're going to talk about as well, which was uh, part of our partnership with the American Ex-Prisoners of War. So thank you again very much. If you have questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to drop those in the comments and Jennifer or I will answer those as best we can. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. We'll announce it, but right now I think we're going to end up doing it on Fridays for a while until we get back to normal operations. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye.